Hey, everyone. My name is Rogelio Guzman. I'm part of the Jess core team, and I work as a front-end engineer at Docker. So I love testing, but I often find myself not testing enough. So how is it that if I really like something, I still don't do it? And a lot of it has to do with the problems and the number of tools that we have to stitch together when we think about testing. Which brings me to the idea that I might just like the idea of testing. <laughs> so at Docker, we were having this problem where we were not writing enough tests. And it was mainly because our tests were taking too long, which made it really slow for us to iterate on them. So I was trying to motivate our team to test and write more, but it's really hard to start doing that when the tools are not working on your favor. And if you don't have an environment that makes it really easy to write tests, then you end up writing, not writing them. So when the effort of writing tests is really high, you write less tests. And the same is true for when the effort of writing tests is low. You end up writing way more tests. So at this point at Docker, we were using a combination of tools that were not providing us with a cohesive experience. And a lot of it was not the fault of the tools that we were using. On the contrary, they were all great tools. But we just never took the time to optimize how they work together which means that we ended up with this really slow testing solution. So this was around like halfway through 2016. And at this point, I have heard a couple of things about Jest. I've seen that it has, if it has had a couple of good releases. So one day, I just gave it a shot and to see like what it would take to migrate all of our tests to Jest. And surprisingly, the transition was Fairly simple, like after like a day or two, all of our tests were migrated, and we have removed several dependencies from our code base. But most importantly, it's, it meant that every time that we hired someone new, they wouldn't have to think about all these dependencies, but, in, but they would just be thinking about this single dependency for testing, which means that it reduces a lot of the cognitive overhead that comes whenever we we're hiring someone and ramping them up. So after migrating to Jest, our tests started running in about the sixth of the time. And running a single test w went from taking about five seconds to being almost instant, which means that our feedback loop was way tighter. And this means that we ended up writing more tests. And last but not least, we were able to start using snapshot tests, which we're going to be using a lot today. OK, so what does it take to set up Jest? It's actually fairly straightforward. I have this project where the only th thing that we need to do is to add Jest as a dependency, and that's it. We're done. That's the only thing that we need to do. And I also have this really trivial sum function that would add up A and B, and I already went ahead and, creating a, and created a corresponding test file for it. So let's launch Jest in watch mode and see what happens. When we launch it, we see that it already found the file, and it already figured out that it doesn't have any tests. So let's write one. This one is, it adds up two numbers, and it expects that the sum of one and two will be equal to three, like nothing really exciting. So if we run it, Jess will pick up the change, it will rerun the tests, and in this case, they're passing. But if we change it to be a four, they will fail, and Every time that we're saving something, Jest is re uh, automatically rerunning all of our tests. So this is great. Like, I know that it was not super exciting, but we actually didn't do much work to set it up, and we already have all that environment working. So by the way, all of the code that we are going to be working with in the talk is going to be available later at this GitHub repo so that you can use it as a reference. So our sum example was great for setting up Jest. But for the rest of the talk, we're going to be using this other application. It's called Emoji Cinema. And it's basically a type ahead where you can start typing the name of a movie, and you're going to get the emoji representation of that movie back. <laughs> so for example, if you type Frozen, you get a snowflake and a dress. If you type Finding Nemo, you're going to get a lens and a fish. 
So let's dive into how this application is architected. It basically has this movie list component that takes in a query, a C prop, and renders a set of movies. And if we dive into this movie list component, we see that the core of our application is this function called search movies, which also takes in a query and returns an array of movies. For example, if we pass the letter F, it will return us all the movies that contain the letter F. So let's see how that search, func search movies function is implemented. It takes in a query, it has an emoji map, it filters, it filters through it and returns the movies that match that given query. And our emoji map looks something like this, where we have several movies like Kung Fu Panda and Harry Potter and E.T., etc. So how would we test something like this? So our initial approach would be to do something like, okay, we just expect our search movies of F to match some set of movies, right? That sounds like a good way of starting. So let's write a test for it. It returns the movies that match the query. And let's start writing our expectation. But halfway through, like, while we're writing it, we realize that we don't know what are all the movies that match the letter F. And even if we did know, I don't know if you guys have tried pasting some emojis into your editor. It gets really weird, and if they have like more than one Unicode character, it just gets even worse. So we just do what we always do, right? Like, we just comment it out, we console log it, <laughs> and perfect. And after console logging it, we see that it's frozen, Kung Fu Panda, and Finding Nemo. Perfect. So we just go ahead, paste that into our test, <laughs> and rerun it. And now, perfect, we have a passing test. So that's great. But now, let's imagine that Frozen 2 comes along. And you're like, oh, really? So you, you modify all, your emo all of your emoji map, and you modify your application, and then you rerun your tests, and bam, they're failing. You're like, oh, OK, this makes sense. It's because I haven't added Frozen 2 to my test. So we go and we do the same exercise. We just copy over the emojis from the output of Just, and we add it to our test. We have a passing test now. Perfect. So now, so what would happen if our search movies function started returning more than just a title and emoji? It started returning more metadata, let's say the year. So if you go ahead and add the year to your emoji map and all of that and run your tests, they're going to fail again. And it's a similar type of error, right? You go and you copy over the year of all the movies, and you're ready to go. So that's great. But you might have realized that we're in this manual clunky process of having a failing test and then manually verifying that that output is the expected behavior of our application, and then copying it over to our test, pasting it, rerunning our tests, and then having a passing test now, which we could generalize these to we have a failing test, we manually verify and update the test, and then we rerun it. So there must be a better approach of doing this, because this has a couple of problems, right? It's a manual process. It doesn't really adapt to changes, because right now it was only one test that was failing, but let's imagine that instead of that, we have a set of like 300 tests that are affected by our code change. So this just prevents us from either doing a really big refactor that is going to break a lot of tests, or from testing so that we can do our big refactor and then we just don't test. So this makes it really hard to maintain. And to solve this, Jazz has this approach called snapshot testing, which we can think about it as the same thing that we have been doing, except that instead of us doing all the manual work of verifying the output and copying and pasting it, we're going to delegate that to Jest, and we're going to automate it. So let's see how that would look. We're going to go back to our trivial sum function. And our first step to converting this to a snapshot test is going to be to extract the hard-coded assertion that we have there. And by doing that, we're going to be telling Jest, hey, I want to delegate you all of this, just by saying too much snapshot. And let's see what 
just is doing in reality when we're doing a two-match snapshot. So it will grab the output of a function, and it will compare it, and it will save it in a snapshot file. So this is where Jest is going to be managing the states of each snapshot. And then the next time that we rerun our tests, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to figure out that it already has a snapshot saved for that given test, and it's going to compare it. It's going to say, OK, 3 and 3 are the same. Perfect. Your test passes. Then if for some reason our some function returns a 4, then it's going to fail. It's going to give us an error telling, you, telling us, hey, one of your snapshots failed. And whenever this happens, it's because of one of two things. We either changed the behavior of our application, and our tests need to be updated to reflect that, or we introduced a bug in our application, and we need to fix it. When, and so Jess just tells us that we can press U to update all of our snapshots if we want to do so. So this has several benefits, because it is an automated process. We're not doing anything. And it really adapts to changes, which means that it doesn't matter if we're updating one snapshot or 300. The effort of doing so is the same, which makes it really easy to maintain and scale. So let's see how this would look for our, our same sum function. So again, we go and we change it from a we change it from a 2b equal 3 to a two match snapshot. Oh, this one's not updating here. So we change it to a two match snapshot, and this generates this file, which is our snapshot file. And it, it tells us that the output of that test was three. Perfect. So now if we go and change our sum to something that returns four, our snapshot's going to fail, and it's going to tell us, hey, these snapshots do not match. So that's kind of like all the effort that we need to do in order to deal with snapshots. So like, let's take a step back and let's see how all of these plays with our Emoji Cinema application. Again, remember it has a type ahead where it returns you all the movies that match that letter. OK, so let's go back. We, we were here, and we only had Frozen, Finding Nemo, and Kung Fu Panda. So our first step is going to be to extract the hard-coded value from our test, and we're going to do that and replace it with a two-match snapshot. So we run our test, and now Jess tells us, like, oh, perfect, you have one snapshot that was written. OK, and now our the way that it works is that Jess will compare the snapshot, and it will save it into a snapshot file. And that snapshot file is going to look like this, which you can see that it actually looks fairly similar to what our test had. It's actually just the same representation, but Jess did all the serialization and the and we'll stringify it so that it will save it in a file, and so you don't have to do any of that. And now let's see what the process would be if Frozen 2 came out. So we, we, we change all, everything in our application, we do the same thing, we rerun it, and we get a similar error than before. But this is slightly different, because now it's telling us that the snapshots do not match. This was because Jess compared the output, and it figured out that something has changed. So we can just press U, and Jess will update the snapshot, and we should be ready to go. And now our snapshot is going to look something like this. So you can see we achieved the same thing, but we didn't update anything on our own. So this is good. But there's still something that really annoys me about this snapshot. And it is that there's a lot of noise. You can see that it has an array and an object and, and it has the like emoji and the title keys, which in reality, I want my snapshot to look more like what we have on the right-hand side, because that's also what our application looks like. So how are we going to do this? So to do this, there's, Jess comes with this concept called snapshot serializers. And we can think about them as, what should the snapshot look like? Right? They define how the snapshot is going to be serialized and then stringified. So how do we add a new snapshot serializer? To do that, we only need to have an object that has two functions, a test function and a print function. We can think of the test function as a function that returns a Boolean, and it basically 
decides whether or not this specific serializer will serialize this value. Right? In this case, it's only going to be serializing movies, uh, which we're going to define as something that has a title and an emoji. And then there's our print function, which tells you how the snapshot for this specific value is going to look. In this case, for each of the movies, we're going to concatenate the emoji and the title. Perfect. So once we have this, how do we use it in our application? That's the best part. Like We don't have to do almost anything with our tests. We just put it on top of our test file, and Jess would figure out that it needs to use that serializer, and that's it. You can see like we didn't have to touch any of our tests to use the serializer. Now, Jess obviously tells us that something failed, and that's because our, snapshots, our snapshot doesn't match the previous one, which is exactly what we expected. So we press U, just update, updates it, and now our snapshot file looks like this. Perfect, which is kind of what we want. And then if we rerun our tests, they're passing. Perfect. So we've been really deep into our application, but let's take a step back and go into our movie list component. Remember, that's like our main component of our app, and it takes in that query that we mentioned and renders all the movies. So how would we test this? Our first option is, well, we simply don't, right? Like testing UI is hard and it's weird, so we just don't test it. Our second option is, okay, we're going to like spin up a browser, set up Selenium, but this also comes with some problems because it's kind of flaky and it's slow, and whenever something changes in our application, the maintenance cost of it is really high. And not surprisingly, the third option is going to be snapshots. So we can think of our movie list component as a function, right? Thanks of like, thanks to how the render method works in React, we can think about it more or less of a thing that takes in props and renders a set of React elements, which in this case are going to be eventually rendered as DOM. In, OK. So we know that every time that we want to use snapshots, we want that thing, in this case a function or a component, to match a snapshot, right? So that's probably a good place to start. OK, so we have renders movies, and we expect the component to match a snapshot. But how do we get that snapshot? And Sorry, how do we get that component? Well, React already comes with this test renderer module, which we can think about of something that will get a component and render it into memory. And then we can just pass that to Jess in a two-match snapshot, and it will serialize it and stringify it into something that looks like a DOM representation of it. But wait, how does it know how to get the component and serialize it appropriately to look like a DOM? Well, that's where snapshot, sorry, where serializers come into place. Just comes with a set of serializers already built in. For example, it knows how to serialize React elements into what looks more like a DOM representation. So if we run our tests, they will pass, and it will tell us that we, a new snapshot was written. And if we look at it, like, yeah, that looks pretty similar to what our, our, our type ahead would look like. Again, so let's imagine that Frozen 2 comes out. And we're like, OK, let's make the same changes that we always do. We rerun our test, and we get a pretty similar example, a pretty similar failure. But it's actually not. It's telling us that the snapshots do not match. It's not telling us that you, we did an error. It's just letting us know, hey, you probably need to update your snapshots. So we press U, just updates it, and we're, again, ready to go. Wait, so at this point, you might be thinking, hey, you totally forgot to mention Enzyme, because I do test my components. But I don't use like snapshots or anything. I use Enzyme to test them. So like, how does that play here? So we're going we're to be using serializers again. So let's go back to our main test, where we're saying that we want our component to match a snapshot. And there's already a serializer that will serialize Enzyme component, or like en components that got rendered with Enzyme into a snapshot. We just need to install Enzyme to JSON, and then we can use this serializer. But you can see that our tests are still passing. And that's the beauty of snapshots. 
because we totally swapped how we are rendering our component, but because snapshots are only interested in what the output of that function is, our tests are still passing, because like, there was no behavior that changed in our application. We just went from using the React test renderer to Ensign. And we can do something similar if we want to use shallow render, and it will also work. So we've been thinking about our application and, and, and about our tests as a single static thing. But the truth is that our application is not like that. Every time that the user is typing something, our application is transforming. And the, out, the, the UI of it, like every time that we type letter, we get different results. So it would be great if we could capture all of these transformations of a given object over time. So how could we do that? Let's go back to the test that we always have. And we're simply going to iterate on a couple of like key or a set of like characters. In this case, let's imagine that we're typing frozen2, and we type f, and then at some point we typed fro, and then at some other point we typed frozen2. So you can see we added two more snapshots, one for fro and one for frozen2. But the complexity of our test did not go up. Right? Like imagine if you were doing this without snapshots, the complexity of your test will be going up. Because for each of those states, you need to know exactly which movies are matching that snapshot at that given time. Right? So, but here, it didn't go up, which is really interesting. And Jess will add two snapshots, which will look like that. And you can see they're both a representation of how our UI looks at that given time. In this case, one is for when we have FRO as a query, and the other one is for when we have frozen2 as a query. Okay. So all of these object transformations over time, we can think about them as a movie, right? Where each snapshot is just a frame in that given movie that it's like telling us a whole story of how the user is interacting with that given object. And now imagine if we start adding tools to visualize how that given object evolves over time. And we can use parts of Jest to create those tools. So I've, I've been working in this Jest movie tool that I wish I'm probably going to be able to share it with everyone in the next couple of weeks. But it kind of looks like this. You can see it found, it found this snapshot file, and then it also found what it calls a movie, which in this case is our renders movies test, and it knows that it has three frames. And you can, we can use the arrows to go back and forth. So if we start moving through the frames, we can see that the second frame doesn't have Kung Fu Panda and Finding Nemo, and the third one, which is when we were already typing Frozen 2, it only contains Frozen 2. It also comes with the like, diff mode, where it will compare one frame versus the previous one, or like one snapshot versus the previous one. Right, so it knows that the second snapshot does not contain the two, these two movies, and the third one is not contained in this one that was contained in the previous one. So this is a great way of visualizing how our application is evolving over time. Which brings me to the point that Jest is more than a testing framework. Jest is a testing platform. So right now, we have been thinking of Jest as this single package. But the truth is that it's composed of many other packages which can be used independently to adapt to your tools and to just be used for whatever you find most useful. For example, we have just snapshot, which is a standalone snapshot package that will encapsulate all of the logic of how to update and add and manage all of the snapshots which you can use without even using Jest at all. We also have like pretty format, which is what the serializers are using to know how to serialize all of the data. So you can also use that to integrate it into any of your tools and, and be able to like pretty format any of your either like built-in JavaScript types or just start to create like new serializers for your tooling. It also has like Jest Validate, which is a tool that validates all the configuration 
arguments that come from the command line. And it gives you like all sorts of like validation error and deprecation warning. This is actually what like Prettier is using for validating their command line arguments also. They're not, they're just using the like just validate package. So what's next, right? Snapshots, it's an open area of research. To be honest, it's just the beginning of snapshots. And I really believe that a lot of it could come in new ways that we can start thinking of snapshots. For example, like, I don't know how many of you end up testing your like, Webpack config, right? Like, we don't do it that often because it's hard to test, but it still dictates a lot of how our application is going to be bundled. And there's a lot of logic of how we're going to bundle it in production versus in development. So what if we could do stuff like, oh, just give me a snapshot of my current Webpack config, and we can s serialize out some values that we don't want to be in that snapshot. So there's a lot of like really interesting things that could be done with snapshots outside of just testing. Anyway, I invite everyone to contribute. Thanks for listening. I'm more than happy to help out with anything. Please feel free to come to me at the break or just send me a message on Twitter. I'm, thanks for listening. I'm more than happy to help. <laughs>